the idea was to be a bit more concrete than what we've been in the previous uh, hour, to try to give kind of a listing of what we what what kind of system or process or tricks we would suggest. Um, what to do? What to do? You know, in this first phase, which is generate and, and, and you know uh, multiply uh, possible ideas, we've been trying many kind of stimulation system. You know, our friend Atik Rahimi was generating uh, stimulus for to create new ideas through body, through m movement, movement of body and contact between bodies. You know, to as if every body position, every uh, every every way to interact with the other. Uh, generates a, 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 a metaphoric start for a possible uh, idea, right? And we tried with pictures, you know, like throwing a bunch of pictures to writers and to see how the brains of the writers, uh, it's not giving them ideas, because a picture is not an idea. A picture is just a picture. And the idea is how the brain of each uh, projects itself or uh, uh, generates a world around that human being because we are machines like we were saying in the first segment we are machine to generate more interpretation than what is given to us we are we populate if you if we give each of us a picture we will not just see a picture we will populate that picture with possible with possibilities around about who that person is and uh, so pictures and pictures of context and so putting together pictures of context and pictures of humans, uh, of characters, is already like very rich. Uh, and when you add to it, you could even start with just music. You know, just a song. A song as a starting point. Then if you put a song plus a face of a character, it's already a, you know, a human situation that develops very naturally. One of our consultants, uh, uh, um, Nolwenn, who who is, once you have, a, uh, once you have a, 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 a face, a character, with that character, if you feel like you are very attracted with that character, so you invent the first group of possibilities of who that character is and what is the problem with that character, and then she's just playing with that character, you know, she, she asks you who that character is with cards, tarots. You know, tuck, 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 tuck. and oh my God, yesterday that, and, and be careful tomorrow. Uh, and, and then, so it's just uh, uh, throwing stimulus and creating interactions so that the, 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 each writer's brain can start a process, you know? I have a question because I am very interested in what you say. Uh, but I have a burning question inside me <laughs> uh, for, cre uh, for creativity, for making uh, scripts, for uh, um, cinema. Uh, uh, is it necessary to have an intention, a goal, uh, or only to have creativity? Uh, I don't have any answer for that. You can start without any intention, and then intention is created while the process is is feeding itself. The thing is with intention, it's a bit like what we were saying about wanting to know what you want to say. It puts a huge amount of pressure on the project if you if you think that you need to have it at the start, because then you're already kind of curbing the possibilities of what it can be. You know, you're already kind of restricting it somehow. I mean, if you have it, it's great, but. It, it, mm -hmm. In my experience, I think we have to precise at what stage of the creative process we, 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 we are uh, when we talk about this, because uh, when you don't have anything or just an image, just a character, just for me, for example, an action verb, I want to do something about saving, about pursuing, because action verb are very interesting because it, makes, it brings a movement, it, because we are a lot about word about being, uh, seem, uh, psychological verbs, and these verbs are very tricky to work with, but action verbs that put you in the in necessity of movement, that I think they are very interesting. But still, if you discovering what you want to say, it, you need time. Uh, Olivier was saying, time is a... 
is a necessary necessary element in that process. And then after a while, start to do combination and you start maybe to build an intention. But what you, we, you are talking about, it's also, I think we need a goal, but not at not first. Not initially. Yes. Mm. Later, maybe. Yes. And, yeah, also, yes. and also because I think like if you think that you know your intention precisely, exactly, like this mm -hmm. is exactly what I want to say, then you get to there's, because I think there's some, I mean, I don't know if there's phases or whatever, but I feel like you do discover your film in so many different versions as you write it. And I think there's this last one, which is like, obviously, if you're also shooting the film, which is like also rewriting it, you know, in many ways. And you can discover this last thing, which is often like the most interesting thing. But I think if you tell yourself too much, this is what the film okay. is about, you've mm. blocked. It's good for me. I, uh, I am okay with that. You, you, yes, you agree. It's very good to, to know that for, from you. It's also linked it's not to a the rule, fact that it's been a, a lot feeling. of the most interesting part of the material that you generate is the subconscious part, the, the, at least the non-conscious part, the, the part which is, I feel I want this, I don't know why, you know, but I'm attracted to, to this. Okay. And what is interesting in, in generating a playful uh, start for ideas okay. is that it unlocks the judgments of yourselves over yourself. It unlocks, so it's all, all about unlocking uh, control. And maybe um, what you call intention when you are writing something and that your intention is to make a movie, you have this intention, but most of the time people want to make movies without having anything to tell. And uh, this is a good question to ask them. Um, okay, you want to make a movie just like everybody, but what do you want to say? Uh, what problem do you want to solve or to expose? Um, and maybe what genre is your story? And the genre is an intention, because if you want to tell a detective story, it's not uh, maybe it's not a comedy, maybe it is. So um, uh, this is a good question to ask yourself in terms of frame, because uh, yes. I believe in frames. Mm. Uh, if you don't have any frames, creativity okay. is just bullshit. You know? I think a more relaxing thing for a writer to think is not what is my intention, but what am I interested in exploring? You know, that's like a very, it's, a, it's a, just a change of linguistics, but it helps you so much more as opposed to like, you know, intent, like suddenly you're not putting this end point, but rather you're opening a kind of universe, you know, and then you can elucidate what you find fascinating or touch or, and discover what it is that interests you of the subject matter without kind Say, of... Say, what is your problem, for example? Or mm. a theme, uh, topic or theme. Can topic, be yeah. Yes, but not more precise than yeah. a theme. Mm. Yes? No. Yeah. Well, it depends. Uh, something that uh, all, all the techniques you describe uh, in your workshops uh, is funny because, uh, for example, um, it's a writer, but there was no movies at the time. It was uh, Stendhal. Um, he used to be uh, very conscious about the impossibility to start. When you start, you are always blocked because you want to start. If you want to start something new, uh, you are blocked. So his trick was to continue something. So um, uh, he wouldn't start with a white page. He would start with uh, reading what he had read, uh, written the day before, or maybe an article, or maybe an image. And um, I know that some painters do that too. For example, uh, Francis Bacon, his, uh, his workshop was a real mess. Um, so as soon as he would like enter his uh, workshop, his atelier, don't you say, uh, mm -hmm. He would uh, set foot on the picture, he, something he had done the day before. It was on the floor, so he had to pick it up and immediately he had to put the dirt away and correct it and he was immediately in the action. So uh, a good technique is instead of starting, try continuing because uh, many creators do that. They put creation on the side because this is too big a word. If you, have, if you think you have to create, you have to start something new, ex nihilo, as we say, out of nothing, and you feel yeah. afraid. If you just continue, maybe you need to correct something. So the good thing is, uh, a good advice, I think, uh, coming from these uh, artists, is uh, don't think about the first sentence. Uh, don't think about starting. Try a way to just continue something, mm -hmm. you know? It's a good trick. And that's because it's more natural. Because, in fact, the story we're going to count is, uh, is uh, a part of the big story. 
you know, because uh, you enter to the story from that point, you've gone out from that point, but in fact the story begins before, and it's very interesting afterward for the off of the character to know what, what was going before, before the time that we... So if you are in the idea to write a story, not as from the beginning, but as a part of the story, you are in a more natural course of your flow of the story. Mm. Because the story never beginning, never end. You just decide at a point to put a, a frame, a, a, frame mm. a beginning and the end. Mm. But the story has begun already, you know? So uh, what, what, is it, what is really interesting what you say is that uh, it, w it can be maybe summarized in never let yourself be immobile. Don't stop, just continue. Up, yes, just always pick up somewhere a source of movement, a source of yeah. elaboration. It's, uh, yeah. And uh, listening to somewhere. music is very powerful too because you follow something else movement or you can steal somebody else movement. Maybe watching a movie can give you an idea. When you are stuck, just put your imagination in movement. And also something else I think, which maybe I never thought of it like as tying in with a continuation, but I think sometimes just also like, let's say you have this, like a small, you don't know if it's an idea, but it's something, you know, and like, but of course that's the point where you could be like, it's this blank page and you're like, should I, should I, but actually just say like, it's like you put a square on, you're like, okay, I'm committing to this. So this thing already exists. Like I don't need to start it, it's there. And then, in fact, actually, I find that super useful because you've limited yourself already to that one thought. So you're almost continuing it, like you're deceiving yourself that it already existed. And then you can discover it so much more easily. But sometimes all you need to do is like, no, this is, it's not a new idea. It's already there. Like, it's, and sometimes maybe you just need to think about something. So maybe you have an idea and then say like, I'll take two, three months and see if it sits with me. And as long as it kind of stays somewhere, then it's part of a process, you know, and it doesn't feel like something new, which... Maybe we could ask you uh, one question, because I, I know a technique that works and that I stole from someone, um, because it's very difficult to write uh, without your own judgment. It's very difficult. And uh, some people uh, stay stuck with the first three pages of some project. They keep uh, rewriting for uh, years and uh, they always stay stuck there. So um, a technique I discovered is that instead of writing what you think you want to write with intention, you open a file um, and uh, like a jazz player where you put bullshit, you just let it come and you know it's, it won't be used for your project. So it's like a box, but it's a pre-box, it's a pre-writing thing. So you choose this pre-writing state and this is a file for bullshit you know you're not gonna use it and I know that what happened to me is most of the time the good ideas uh, come from the bullshit uh, file and what I was trying to to write it doesn't work so after a few weeks of that suddenly I think yeah it's weird I spend more time in my bullshit box than in my uh, project and maybe this one is better and in the end it's better you know because it's like free jazz there's more freedom in it so it works well to trick you. It's like... Uh, Tricks, they're the most useful thing. No? Yeah, instead of writing. working, maybe we should take a break and keep filming without saying we are filming. And when you think you are taking a break, this is when you are the most creative. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's something of the same kind, uh, which is in a way linked with the fact that we should step out of the, the idea, the romantic idea that the writer is somebody who is supposed to wait for uh, transcendence to inspire him in a way or another, uh, as if, you know, something was going to come from the air. Um, life in itself is a constant source of stimulation. Because, uh, and you, and especially today, we are all with our iPhones, etc. even when we take the bus. But we have uh, so many humans come, uh, you know, that we are, um, you know, that cross our paths. And so many uh, human situations and so many um, field of possibilities that we cross every day. That if you look at just one day, even one year during a, a whole year of writing, using just one day as a source of stimulus. 
And this writer is taking the bus, for instance, to just uh, when they're trying to find a character, you know, uh, taking the bus and taking the bus <laughs> no, all day long and, and dictaphone, uh, um, you know, taking notes of, oh, this old lady with her dog. This, it's weird how she talks to the dog, etc. And, and then, uh, uh, so to see life as a constant uh, source of, 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 of parameters with which you can play. And, which, and, and then you can choose, because of course you're not, it doesn't mean that everything that life sends to you is a source, but it means that you can choose what you feel, what you feel connected to in the field of possibilities that the river of life sends to you every, every day. So the neighbor, which is why spying on your neighbors you know, can, is a very interesting thing. You know, from the window, you know, like, uh, wow, my God, you just see, why is he undressing every day at uh, 9.30? You're going to sure. end up at the police station. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, maybe I have a question for you about, do you think that these tools, they're very universal, that there is a common ground to all writers about what are the tools that works or don't work? Or do you think that it's very an in, linked to idiosyncrasy, like something very individual? from the people you, you talk with? The, the fact that uh, this openness to stimuli in the environment is a very important aspect, and I think as a psychiatrist you, 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 you know this better uh, than me, is what is called uh, inhibition, latent inhibition. Uh, so creative people uh, with high IQ, I precise, uh, have this reduced latent inhibition. So uh, they are their filter of uh, st external stimuli and even internal stimuli are deficient. They don't work very well, uh, leading to the entrance of a lot of information. For uh, in situation uh, in, in for schizophrenia or psychosis, uh, it has been a link to the same thing: reduced latent inhibition. But it seems that it's uh, linked to low IQ. For higher creative people, they have a high IQ and also this reduced latent inhibition. And this is something that helped them to make sense of all these stimuli, to use these stimuli that are entering, uh, uh, that the, the person consider stimuli from the environment, external environment, and also from uh, internal uh, stimuli, internal uh, events, internal information. So they, are, they have this acute awareness of their environment, physical, social, and internal. Uh, and this, when you, when you talk about the, uh, uh, the um, uh, sort of chaotic or uh, friction between ideas. If you do have access to a lot of ideas, of course there will be friction and there will be uh, creativity. And this is uh, something that can be, I don't know if it's possible to improve it by techniques, is to allow this openness, and this openness is, uh, is could be a personality uh, threat and also it could be manipulated by things like for example what you do is to, to broaden the attention uh, to absorb more information from internal uh, thoughts internal feelings and also from the the, the external world so in, in my opinion it, in the first phase where you want people to come up with a lot of ideas. We are not selecting, we are not judging, we are just want to have more than one type of story or more than one idea of story, is to allow uh, what, what psychologists call defocused attention. We are not focusing on something, we are opening, it's like for example a spotlight with narrow, you know, you, you, with your phone, for example, you, you, you use the, the spotlight. The spotlight could be narrow, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you, you, you can view only this, or you can view this. So it's open possibilities and opportunities. So this is something, uh, I don't know which technique would, would help to broaden the scope of attention to internal feelings and stimuli, and also to uh, the word that... Uh, Confrontation. Confrontations. Exploration, confrontation, and also I think techniques of, um, for, for instance, I work with drones. 
I mean, you know, she drones and uh, I, I draw as well. And drawings, in fact, have helps very much the uh, creative process because they have something with figures or free figures which, um, which stimulate the words, really. And I begin for, for instance, when we, we do the brainstorming, you know, and you, you recall ideas or whatever, and we do a kind of drawing already because we put ideas, etc., in a kind of figure, and we begin to redraw the figure, the figure which is on the brainstorming itself, and we we try to color it. I mean, to put colors, maybe to enlarge this figure, and to and to discuss about this figure. And afterward, it's a really, really drawings with the figure which emerges. And, and which seems to, to please to the author. And he says, that's the drawing which I like for my script right now, you know? But we let it emerge in asking which kind of figure, you know, and what we miss in order to create this figure. Alexis? Yeah, I, I was going to ask just before that, uh, that could it be possible that writers develop non-verbal thinking techniques? Yeah, yeah. So in a, even more general than just yeah. drawing, but non-verbal, mm. the idea to develop non-verbal ideas um, somehow. In fact, to put figures and colors help very much to develop the verb. It's There's a great it's a lady. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. British because, mathematician yeah. Roger Penrose, who explains that he thinks by ways of diagrams, and he, precise, he precises that when he creates diagrams, they are nonverbal thinking. And he says, I mean, they're more useful for me than, than just words. I'm more, ideas come much more better when I use diagrams than when I use words. And I think it's also because uh, words have, well, that's what words are, they fix things. So they stop the dynamics and their concept, well, they, they fix concepts. So the idea to develop nonverbal techniques uh, could also be a yeah. which is why which is why uh, because uh, sorry I, uh, in terms of practicalities it's exactly the reason why we try to push the writers postpone the writing and postpone first writing. Pop okay. populate their brains <clears throat> and through uh, whatever means can help them populate the, 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 their world and and their co co uh, continuity uh, and their possible architecture, complexity, etc. Um, and so orality is a fantastic tool for that. It seems that the, 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 the language, oral language, is a machine to generate worlds which can sometimes be more efficient than putting it on paper. Uh, or, yeah. or another thing though, I think, because it depends also, I think if you're a very verbal person, that also then that's your instrument. But it's something that I found sometimes quite useful is like actually kind of like almost writing like a poem, but it's like, a, or like it's sort of semi like poem sort of stream of consciousness. And it's just because it's still writing, which is my, in the end, my comfort zone, but it's not tied to like any, again, without this pressure, you know? So actually, and then it kind of, and maybe like within mind the character or a sort of situation or a reflection or maybe this vague idea. And I found that super useful because in a way like you start entering whether it's, I think with the character it works, it, like your lion that you were talking about yesterday. You know, you enter this kind of trance and it's no, there's no kind of right or wrong, but you can still express and you find those words and sometimes even the rhythm of what you're writing tells you something about the rhythm of the film, maybe that you're interested in making, you know, like where it picks up, you know, there's... A written drawing. No, no, it's a, like kind a... Kind of a written, you know. It's, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. I suppose, yeah, yeah, exactly, because it's like a flow, you know, and you can either type it or write it, but you see, like, with typing, you also see where you maybe have a space or where you... And it, there's funny things that you can get from that, you know, or words that repeat themselves, you know, that then come. kind of linked to mind mapping also, to possibility yeah. of creating yeah. a tree of possibilities with keywords and mm. yeah. diagrams. Is there tricks that you can give? Well, I don't know if, if there is a general theory of diagrams. There's diagrams in physics, in mathematics, and in all in the subfields of physics and mathematics. But I, as I was saying uh, earlier, uh, they have 
two roles, the diagrams in physics and mathematics. First, they can constitute in some way a pre-theory. I mean, they're a way of approaching a new theory uh, by uh, shortcuts of the uh, verbal way of doing things. That's the first role. And the second one, um, uh, in mathematics, when you do mathematics, you have one foot in algebra and the other in, in geometry. Algebra is somehow blind. And, uh, what do you mean blind? Well, I mean, when you... Um, what do I mean by blind? Um, it's one of the goal of mathematics it, is to find some um, incarnation of algebraic procedures. So when I mean that algebra is blind, I mean there's no way of seeing uh, algebra. And when people construct algebraic representation, uh, diagrammatic representation of algebras, they don't just write algebras, they show that in that kind of calculation, there is a, a figure, a dynamic figure behind that kind of calculus. That's one of the role of diagrams. When Penrose does a conference, he does it by hand. And he makes a superposition of uh, uh, transparencies so to show how the way he can construct diagrams. I know that in the research about DNA, the, when they were looking for the shape of DNA, um, they, are, they were trying to build, uh, some, some people were trying to take a picture of it uh, with a crystallography, and some others were trying to build it with uh, like, a, like toys, you know? And um, at the beginning, uh, they were exploring that and they were looking um, the right shape without knowing exactly what it would be. And when the shape was right, I mean, when it was beautiful, they felt it was true. So mm. they were looking for the, an inspiring shape. You know? And uh, at one point they said, well, this is so beautiful, that must be true. You know? And then they had to check it. That's very common in mathematics and physics. People, physicists will tell you, I prefer that theory because it's, it has more aesthetical aspect. Even though from an experimental point of view, it's not very, uh, very close to, but they more believe but what do they mean by aesthetical point of view? What do they mean when they say it's more beautiful? It can be something very technical. For example, we have integral that converges. That, I mean, their limits goes to a finite uh, number. But we also have integrals that don't go to a finite numbers. So for some reasons, an aesthetic integral is one that has a finite uh, result uh, for, for its limit. And now it's an finite result. So it's very... Um, it's in a very precise way when they mean beautiful. I mean, uh, yeah, I was taking the example of DNA because in the end, this is a real shape that you find in nature and we are looking mm. to build something real. It ends up on screen. This is, this is linked with uh, when we work uh, about story structure, um, we work about, uh, also about creating equilibrium in terms of rhythm. So finding a way to create a diagram or a graphic representation of a story architecture uh, is a way to be able to see whether we are generating balance or not. Whether we're generating, you know, a, a harmony of some kind, like you're saying, a physician saying, uh, I, I'd physicist, rather yeah. a physicist uh, 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 pre preferring one solution because it seems more beautiful. I think that for story architectures, for scripts, uh, for films, um, there is something of the same kind. And so if you don't generate, if, you're, if you just write scene after scene, uh, and if your only tool to apprehend structure, story structure, is through dialogues, etc., you cannot see the shape of the animal as a whole. In the field of mathematics and physics, again, people make a difference between a figure a drawing and a diagram. A figure is static in, it, in its process, and a diagram puts dynamics in the figure. Yeah. So that's, it's more a process of diagrammatizing than just doing diagrams. I mean, people are left with some figures, and the creativity comes when they transform the figure into a diagram. And that is going on with the, the, the fact that they put dynamics in the figure. 
and the fact of putting dynamics of the finger show well uh, uh, draws new new insight. Yeah. In 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 the field on the, the on which the people are working on. What you are saying it inspires me a new notion to propose, uh, the notion of the play to play. Uh, uh, French philosopher uh, Eric Fiat. Uh, works about uh, different medical problems like uh, pain and Eric Fiat says the problem with the pain is uh, we can not no more play uh, our life and uh, what you say about diagrams and all the drawings inspires me the importance maybe uh, of playing uh, and uh, I imagine uh, uh, an author with Tucker, uh, how can he play again? Uh, what, what possibilities to to be, to play again? Uh, and every kind of play of jeu of games uh, can be adequate, uh, I think, uh, if it creates if the game creates joy. I think there is a script concept that I don't remember his name that used Playmobile. Sometimes <laughs> with people, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know, if you, if you know him. So he has his toolbox, he has toys, and so he has characters, and like, like six years old person, you know. And they, so it's, it's about point of view, and, uh, you know, it's about, think about narrative point of view, but whatever. It's about Old Tyler. Yeah, yes. And it's, it's, it's playful, it's bringing playfulness to the, to the thing, and I think, yeah, it can be, it can be a, uh, an interesting idea. In terms of process, I, I've, I've heard, is it true that uh, when you bring playfulness, which is often something that lacks completely when writers are in a difficult moment, you know, playfulness is very, very far away. They cannot play anymore. Mm -hmm. And it seems that playfulness is a condition uh, uh, to generate the, the needed intellectual flexibility to generate possibilities. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I, I do agree. Um, it, again, it's uh, in the process of uh, creating a script or whatever, uh, a mathematic formula. Or, there are phases where uh, the process involves mainly divergent thinking, which is coming up with a lot of ideas. Uh, there is no upper limit of the number of ideas we will have. So we need some flexibility, we need some uh, uh, access to our uh, to, to the stimuli, to, to concepts in the memory, to uh, our past uh, uh, events and, and so on. Uh, so this divergent thinking is very important and um, I think the playfulness is helpful in this phase. Uh, and the, in other phase of the process of cr uh, creativity where we are stuck, for example, and uh, we have a problem and there is one answer to this problem and we cannot find it. So here we are in conversion thinking and we don't want to be distracted by anything or anyone. Uh, so it's two different uh, phases. phases, two different processes that can be sometimes nearly simultaneous, depending on which phase we are. And in some cases, and for example, in your phase one, uh, you are in divergent thinking. So if anything that can uh, be playful or uh, uh, because we are still not under the gun, we are not producing. You know, so it's uh, we open up the possibilities. So uh, playfulness, for example, with my students, I have engineer students. So to be creative, to be innovative, uh, I, I, I start by giving them uh, things to play with. So they hate it because, you know, they just say, OK, we're wasting our time. We have so many things to do and uh, they have Legos. They have uh, they, they have to do towers with the spaghetti, with marshmallow. With, and I say, OK, it's like, you know, running a ma marathon. You need to be to be creative. You have to to have some um, little practice, you know, it's uh, when you want to run a marathon, you not jump in the marathon, you, you practice before so to be to be able to come up with the, 
with, uh, with ideas and also to shut down this uh, uh, um, executive control system in our brain that uh, is here in, uh, in the frontal lobe, who control our attention uh, and uh, uh, avoid distractions. So it's just, you know, to open up the possibilities to, so the playfulness, uh, in my opinion, is very important in your phase one. It could be by dancing, by uh, uh, touching, by playing with, uh, with anything. When we are around the table, social pressure, can make it difficult for some 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 individuals. Uh, uh, so we moved the, this session in virtual environments where you are represented by avatars, and this uh, liberates some people. You know, uh, they are like disinhibited, <coughs> and they come up with very crazy idea, very uh, strange idea. Very uh, so the, the, these things were uh, we have been. Uh, uh, Sorry, what do you mean? Can you explain this more about the avatars? How do you? What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, we use a Second Life, uh, the the software Second Life, and uh, we create, for example, in uh, we have uh, different uh, teams working on different aspects, but in uh, the in uh, the parts I I was in charge of, uh, we have a meeting room in our lab, which is uh, the basic uh, type of meeting room with table like this this one. Uh, so we conducted the experiment with uh, uh, three uh, individuals, two, three participants, and uh, and uh, one uh, coach or uh, experimenter, uh, and we created the same room in virtual environments. And we, we gave the same task in physical environments and in uh, virtual environments. The only thing that's changed is uh, in the virtual environments, people who were around the table, they were avatars. So you have someone who represents you at the table, but it's not you. No, no one see you. You are in a small box because we have uh, experimental boxes. You are in small box isolated. You are on your own. But you have chat, uh, it's, you know, uh, thing. So the same task given to same age, you know, we match everything, we control for everything. Uh, the fact that you are um, in isolation, uh, you are free and, you, and it's confidential or anonymous. No one will know that you, you are. are the silly one in the group or, uh, or so. So this help remove a lot of constraints and a uh, blockage. Do you find that you get more interesting and surprising results when you use, let's say, something like the glass or so, like you have a sort of fixed point compared to when it's like a more free, there's not, I don't, I don't know, like there's a more free space. Like, do, is there any uh, kind of results, like whether having a certain starting point helps them to get like str even stranger and more interesting thoughts? There, there are several type of tasks uh, you can use. Uh, the most uh, used one in, in psychology uh, are, uh, in, in terms of diversion thinking task, is you give a, a sort of a clue or something. A starting point. Yes, yeah. a starting point. Uh, but you can have uh, free associations, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah. You can, for example, you can say, um, okay, uh, the, the clue is dress. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you have a dress. I want you to think uh, about uh, it's, it's not divergent thinking, but it's about it's something that is really linked to, to the imagination. Think of something in the past linked to a dress. Mm -hmm. So everyone, you know, you think of the black dress and uh, something you happened to you. Uh, you, you uh, mm -hmm. So you have all the memories coming up, and then you can we can also ask you to think about the future. Uh, link, uh, something in the future linked to this dress. Mm -hmm. So you project yourself in the future. You can also uh, have uh, to think about the, uh, what you will think of this dress. So it's like empathy. Mm -hmm. All these processes that are linked to uh, uh, some uh, elements uh, happens uh, in one part of network in the brain, uh, which is linked to imagination, and it's called the default mode uh, network. And this is really, really important. This, this is the place where creative idea emerge uh, 
uh, and uh, are uh, controlled uh, sometimes for, from uh, the will stop just here. When you teach screenwriting to beginner uh, writers, uh, it's crazy the difference there is between with any type of exercise, creative exercise, if you do the exercise with no constraint, like guys, whatever you want, white page, the result is always more yeah. weak, I mean, is a lot weaker, as opposed to the same exercise with uh, clues or constraints. Yeah. Like here is the place, here is the picture of the face of the man, and etc. Mm -hmm. It's as if the brain, because I, I yeah, want to explain. Yeah, you have certain point. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was the yeah. idea of the de, de Oulipo, yeah. ouvrir de littérature potentielle, founded by Queneau and, and François Le Lyonnais, mathematician, is that creation needs to be done with constraints. Mm. But it's like the continuation thing. It's exactly the same, which is kind of why, like also when I was saying with the box, like sometimes all you need even because you can always go back and reinvent that box entirely but just telling committing to like one thought and saying okay this is my anchor is like can be so helpful because anyways then you can like even with wolf like uh, the the project that i'm shooting now uh, there was the deadline for lim the reason i wrote this script was because there was a deadline for lim which was literally in I thought it was that day. I woke up at 10 and I said like, oh my God, should I write this thing? And then I wrote to the info and I said, I'm really sorry, I haven't written it. Can I have like a day extension? And Massimiliano wrote back because I knew him and he's like, it's me, by the way. And yes, it's tomorrow the deadline. So I was like, okay, 10 hours. You know, it's like, it's a box. I had this kind of thought in my mind. Da, da, da. And I just wrote it and it was good because it was a three page so not like it was a store like three page treatment so like okay it's not really a treatment it's like and just wrote it like saying like again it sort of freed all inhibitions because i had this kind of the limitation of the time the limitation of like this one idea to and then just to start it and finish it and it's funny because obviously then the film turns out to be something very different but in the end the heart is still there but like if you if i hadn't had that that box. Box, you know, yes. around it. Like, no way, I think. You know, I could have ended up even yes. yeah. endlessly, even playing and this and going back and forth. But sometimes just like, you know, you trap it in a box and just see where it goes. Then you can always go backwards. When uh, Hemingway decided to become a writer, he was a journalist. Uh, so he left to Paris and he left in a very poor um, neighborhood. Uh, and he didn't have a lot of money, so he spent his days in, in cafes and he had the commitment to himself, a box. And the box was, okay, every day I'm going to write a short story about anything. So this girl there is waiting for someone, maybe he's not going to show up. And this is the start. So uh, the box is a starting point and the practice. Because when you talk about writing a full story, it's pretty long, so it's kind of abstract. Uh, you're not going to write it in a day, the, the finished product. So you have to uh, cut it into pieces, into little boxes that, that you can add then and go back to. And uh, this I, I think this is a very difficult uh, thing to understand. When you want to write, you have to choose a, a limit, a box, mm. and maybe a number of, of of uh, words, mm. you know. Today I'm gonna write 100 words, mm -hmm. and uh, even if you are bad ones, at the end of the day I have 100 100 words. If you do that for a week, it's 700 words. Mm. If you do that for a year, it's a lot. But, but you have to put the judgment away, yeah. and then you rewrite. And even guys, uh, Stephen King talks about it a lot. He says in the first phase, I write with no judgment and no going back. No judge, uh, I mean, you can read what you have written to remind it. But no editing it. You, you, don't, no. you don't fix it, you don't no. edit it, you don't correct it. And then you put it in a drawer and you work on something else for two months. And then when you take it out of the drawer, you see the, the defects, you see what, you, what needs to be done. And the, the box thing is um, very important. But you know what you're saying also about like sometimes, but actually I think also sometimes writing an ending, because I think endings are terrifying and th th thinking like you don't know where you're going to get to. So actually sometimes, like for me, like it's useful also, like I'm like, okay, 
whatever, I'm just gonna write it all, even, and usually it ends up being a very simplistic arc, in fact, because obviously we all, like, inherently you go back to, like, the basics of, like, what you know as, like, a child. But even then, it like, for me, it's very reassuring to just know like, okay, this is the ending. And then it will never stay. Yeah, like you this. start a love story with a kiss. So you get rid of the tension. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, it's yeah. like, exactly. Or it's like, you know, that, okay, I think that he should end alone because like, I can't, okay, fine. Then that's done. And then it's like, ah, like I can breathe, you know, and then everything is possible. You know, but without this like constant, I think it's like you're stuck in this ocean of like, could it be this or this or this? The or end this is a box, but I, and I was talking about a genre. A genre is a box, so a genre mm -hmm. is very reassuring yeah. uh, to find uh, something new because yeah. you know that within that frame you can be very creative. Yeah. Uh, I love this idea to... of changing genre. I never thought of it, but actually that's super interesting. Like you have an idea, but then think of it as like a thriller or something, you know, maybe it's clearly a drama, but you know, maybe you change yeah, that. If, uh, if you go to so... the dentist, you can tell it as a comedy yeah. or as a, um, a, a love story <laughs> or as a horror story, yeah. you know? depending on the, well, the genre, you're going to get different ideas. Mm -hmm.